Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. We're back. We're live. We're here on a Monday morning at 11 on the 11 o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and it's Community Matters, because it does. Okay, we're just over the session. Does that sound right? Over the session? We're just like over the moon. We're over the session. We got over it. <clears throat> now we can look back on it, make some analysis. The only thing I want to say is what Tom Yamachika and I were talking about before, is that the core um, of any legislative session is the fiscal policy and the taxes, and he's involved in the taxes. He's the president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. He watches everything about taxes. Hi, Tom. Hey, Jay. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for coming down. <laughs> so what happened this session? I mean, uh, in, in a general sense, uh, would you say that this was remarkable in some way? Can you characterize it? You know, yes, no, maybe. How do you feel about this session in, in terms of tax? Well, I, I think we, uh, uh, it, it was kind of a typical session. Uh, some things made it through that are scary. Some things uh, that were scary didn't make it through, thank goodness. And now we just have to kind of um, worry about the ones that are scary. Okay, I have a list of various bills we can talk about. We'll never get to them all, but what about the scary ones? Can we talk about those first? Okay, let's talk about the constitutional amendment. Mm. Okay, so uh, there is going to be on the ballot in November a uh, a constitutional amendment question that basically says, can the, uh, can the state have the power to put a surcharge on real property tax, which is now, uh, you know, and, and since 1978, CONCON uh, has been the exclusive province of the counties. So the counties hate it. Um, the teachers want it. Uh, it's going on the ballot. You know, we already know that the governor can't veto it because that's, that's not how it works. You mean the governor cannot veto a, uh, oh, right, because the Constitution tells you how amendments are made. Right. And it's just an agreement of both houses. They have to have some super vote. Um, I, I think some majority is enough. Majority enough, okay, for yeah. both houses. And, and the governor is not involved in signing Governor's it not or involved. not signing it. That's okay. right. Okay. Well, that's, that's really an interesting. You know, yeah, and, and, the, and the part that's scary uh, is that there are pretty much no limits. It says, uh, investment real property, but that's the only constraint. So Investment real property. So right. What is, what is investment? Do we know what that is? No, the legislature has to define it. So if, if you and I were called to speculate on what that could be defined as, it would be um, anywhere, any, anything where you either make a profit, make, make a return, a return on your investment, or you want to make a return on your investment. You act like you want to. Um, but if you live in that property, then that would not be investment property, am I right? Yeah, I think the only exclusion would be if you live in it. And, and right now we have, like in, in the city and county of Honolulu, uh, we have uh, a different property classification for owner-occupants and, and, and there's everybody else who's a, you know, in residential property. So I, I kind of um, looked at the numbers on it and, and said, okay, if we have all this residential A property, right, and, and we're going to surcharge that at 750, which is what they were talking about last year. Um, that would pull in maybe 113 million. Okay, uh, in the teacher's testimony last year, they said they wanted to get 500 million. So nowhere close. So, uh, so we're thinking what's going to happen is, in order for the teachers to get what they want, they need to not only hit the uh, the residential property that doesn't qualify for a homeowner's exemption, but they got to go after a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so the definition may not be everything other than residential where you live there, but it maybe it would be less than every single other property. There might be other exceptions uh, well, yeah, and, to and, investment property. Yeah, yeah, for example, commercial property. Yeah. Right? It's not residential, but there's nothing in the Constitution, constitutional amendment that says residential. So... That's one way they can, uh, you know, broaden the base. Yeah, so there's going to be a lot of hassling over that. You know, one, one thing strikes me, uh, worth a moment to dwell on it. Yeah, the teachers want it, and the teachers are powerful, and they have a powerful union. But um, there are probably more people who own property. Oh, yeah, but I don't care if I own property and live in my property. 
I'm, 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 I'm safe. So I don't care whether this tax is adopted or not. I might vote for it, even though my, if I owned investment property, I would not vote for it. Why would I tax myself? Uh, why would I take money from you know, the people who own investment property and give it to another group? You know, what, what, what shook me when this first came out was, why don't you just take it out of the general fund? Why are, they, you know, why are they concocting this whole thing about real property tax? Why don't we just increase the tax and be straightforward about it and be direct about it? Why do they have to go to real property? Why are they concocting a new tax just for one purpose? Well, um, their argument is the real property tax is low, and, and it is compared with other states. And, and number two, uh, they're saying, well, geez, um, we have all these uh, evil uh, real estate speculators uh, that are driving up the price of uh, you know our housing. Let's 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 go knock them down, take them down a few pegs. But that's not how this is going to work, you know, in practical terms. How is it going to work? Uh, like I said, number one, you, you'll probably have to go after commercial property. If you do, that's going to impact our cost of living for everybody. Sure, and the mom, mom and pops. The mom and pop small businesses. Yeah, right? and any time you rent, that's that's commercial property or um, investment property. So yeah. So if I own a small store, I mean, I either own the land or I'm a lessee on the land, long term, short term, my cost of occupancy will go up because the real property tax on that land has gone up. That's right. Uh, so the result is the mom and pop businesses will be under further stress and be at a, a, even a greater disadvantage than they already are. Right. Mm, Absolutely, that's not a good thing. Yeah, and, and there's no guarantee at all that any of that money is going to go to the teachers. You know why? Because right now, and, and as you said, we already have a bunch of general fund money going to education, two billion dollars approximately. And if 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 the uh, measure passes and they get maybe five hundred million dollars more. Won't there be a, a whole lot of pressure on legislators to say, well, you know, that $2 billion that was going to education, let's, let's redirect some of it. Away from education. Yeah, we have other needs. We have homeless. Absolutely. You can we see have that invasive happening. species. We have, um, you know, sunscreen in the water, you know, all, all kinds of other needs. Yeah, I mean, and that's gross because then it would reduce the $500 million. And, and, and spend that for, for hobby expenses, if you will. Um, the other thing that might happen, as happened in the barrel tax, is you have a clear statement of, of intention at the outset, um, but the legislature dips into the money, just the way they've dipped into the barrel tax, and use it for reasons that were not originally uh, contemplated. And so uh, it could get lost on either end of that, either end of that continuum, um, on reduction of other ex ex spending, or on um, a, a redistribution of the money that comes in through the special tax. You know, as you said, it's a function of what the legislature ultimately says to implement this amendment, and it could say a lot of things, allowing it lots of flexibility as to what to do with the money. Right, and then, then of course, there's the Me Too factor. The Me Too being, oh. Uh, the, the teachers union got all this all this extra money. Uh, how about the other unions? What are they going to say? Are they going to are they going to simply sit still? Yeah, yeah. And we have a homeless problem. So we spent thirty million dollars in that bill. You know, you mentioned before the show. Um, but you know, that's that's drop in the bucket when you when you calculate how much it really costs to deal with and repatriate the homeless. So maybe there's another constitutional amendment coming down. Who knows what? You know, further it's a further source of income for the state to squeeze on the county real property tax. That's what really troubles me about this. You know, however the low they too. might be, it's this is a a new a new dimension in tax in Hawaii. Right now. Uh, you know, back in the old days, uh, the, the state had the real property taxing power. The counties didn't. Okay, it was only after the '78 Con Con that it was transferred to the counties, so they get their, you know, own uh, basically revenue generation mechanism, because they didn't have very many tools to, uh, to fund their own right, projects. But their obligations did not include education, which that, that's is a correct. state function. So that was a little peculiar, because in most states, uh, education is a county function. That's right. So that's right. It's a little kapakahi what's going on here. What, what, did you uh, did you support or oppose that bill for the amendment? 
Um, we we made comments like we normally do. We don't take positions on anything. Mm. What do you think now? Um, again, like 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 I said, there's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of room for mischief. Uh, once that genie comes out of the bottle, you know, is it going to behave as people intended, or or is it, you know, going to do other stuff? Taxes are inevitably going up. You know, I could ask you the same question after every single session. I could say, Tom, did the taxes go up this year? And it's okay. You would say, yes, they did, Jay. And I could ask you, well, is there anything that went down this year? And you could say every session, <laughs> you could say, no, Jay, it didn't go. Nothing went down. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> it's very rare when stuff does go down. It happens occasionally. But, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, there have been, you know. You have to look in the old history books. Yeah, really? It, it doesn't come to mind right away, does it? No. <laughs> you said there were other scary things. What other scary things come to mind? Okay. Um, one of the things that happened is uh, they went and changed their income tax code uh, because of the, of the Trump tax changes. Now, uh, a lot of the business changes that, that went into effect on the federal level will take effect here. Like, for example, uh, you won't be able to to uh, to write off your you know golf with clients anymore. Sorry, Jay. I don't play golf actually, Tom. Okay, well you neither do I. Okay. <laughs> uh, but but the client entertainment is now non-deductible. Um, it used to be deductible at fifty percent. Uh, the meals are still deductible at fifty percent. Uh, other um, types of you know food and beverage expenses are are fifty percent also. Like for example, if you you know st uh, stock a break room for your employees, uh, and and spend for food, uh, that's fifty percent as well. It's it, it's not fully deductible like it used to be. Okay, so all those all those changes are coming into the Hawaii code. Okay, a lot of the changes on the individual side, uh, what they did on the individual side was they broadened the base, but they they knocked down the rate. Uh, they didn't pick up many of the changes on the individual side at all. So the intent, I understand, is to freeze that at 2017 uh, law. Uh, it's, again, remains to be seen how they'll actually implement it. So the taxes locally um, are, have been, in general, conformed through the federal tax reform bill that Trump passed at the end of last year. Yeah, I mean, normally uh, for the past 60 years or so, we've, we've, we've tracked the federal bill. However, I, I saw in the paper uh, a reference to the fact that the legislature was trying to take advantage of the fact that taxpayers in Hawaii now have more disposable income, at least certain groups of them have more disposable income because of the Trump tax reform bill. Uh, what has happened in that regard? Are we getting to, you know, pay what we were forgiven on the federal level, pay it on the state level? Is that, are they, well, they there, taking there was, our money? There was, there was actually a bill uh, that said that, specifically, um, uh, in the estate tax context. And it said, oh, now that um, uh, the feds aren't taxing the uh, uh, estates as heavily as they used to, it gives us an opportunity. Uh, that bill didn't pass, however. Good. Yeah, <laughs> that, that would have it's increased. So complicated. Yeah, that would have that would have increased the estate tax uh, for state purposes, as well as the conveyance tax. And, and uh, it would, it but would, that one didn't. It chase away people who come here to retire and hope to, you know, avoid uh, estate tax. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean. Yeah. Well, let's uh, we'll take a short break, Tom. That's Tom Yamachika, president of Tax Foundation of Hawaii, and we'll come back and we'll talk about some more of the the bills that we should know about that came out of this session on taxes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, your host on Pacific Partnerships in Education here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every other week, Tuesdays at 3 p.m., we have guests on and talk about the fascinating, interesting, and unique partnerships in education that occur across the Pacific Islands with Hawaii, Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, Palau, Guam. All these places have really rich local education programs going on, 
and the exchange among and between these programs is a wealth of great information, helping the islands all learn uh, how to survive and thrive in our ever-changing world. I hope you'll join us on Pacific Partnerships in Education. Hello, I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair. I have a show called Finding Respect in the Chaos. It's all about women's rights and gender equality. It's a place for survivors of abuse to come on and tell their stories, and a place for advocates to come on and share important resources so that people can get past the abuse and into the hope and healing that's on the other side. I hope you'll join me every other Friday at 3 o'clock for Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair on ThinkTechHawaii.com. Uh, we're here with Tom Yamachiko talking about taxes in the 2018 session, now that it's over and trying to get a handle on how things changed and how taxes might change as a result. And this is not necessarily in order of importance, but let me just go down my list. There's one thing you mentioned that really, to me, is pretty scary, is that as in the federal government, um, you know, there's an organization in state government that evaluates the cost of legislation, any legislation. And, the, and this is very important because sometimes, uh, we'll talk about it later, uh, bills get killed without any express reason when in fact it's just that somebody in the Finance Committee feels there's not enough money for that bill. Um, every, every bill is through the, every money bill goes through the Finance Committees and so forth. So anyway, this, this bill was a bill to make that information, the analysis of how much a leg, any legislative act is going to cost, this was actually a bill that would have changed the uh, secrecy of that information up till now. Right. And that bill failed. Right. Now, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to uh, get some legislation passed, um, one of the things that legislators are going to ask is how much is it going to cost? So uh, typically the Department of Tax will analyze the bill and they'll come up with a number and they typically won't share it with anybody. They'll just share it with the, the legislators, uh, figure, figuring the public doesn't, you know, doesn't have the right to know because you know, there's, there's some taxpayer information that goes into uh, the, these calculations. Not in the cumulative numbers. I mean, in the, in the individual. Well, at, at some at some point, when you when you have um, uh, credits or incentives that that don't affect that many people, uh, you might be able to figure out who, you might who be able it's to affected. It out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, so this has been secret. It troubles me because uh, what it, what it leads to is the priorities. And uh, you know what gets funded, what doesn't get funded, based on some sense of how much it costs. Yeah, and, I'd and like the, to know that. Yeah, and and uh, you know the the methodology, uh, how they come up with their numbers, uh, is is critically important. If if you are trying to get something passed, and and you know and the, and the Department of Tax scores it as a you know huge revenue loser, um, you know, uh, good luck, because because that that bill ain't going anywhere. Yeah. Um, but if you have, uh, you know, some reason to challenge the methodology, uh, which, which you won't unless you know what the methodology is, uh, then you maybe you can kind of save your, uh, you know, uh, save your bill from extinction. Well, the public ought to know. The media ought to know. We ought to be able to say whether a given order of priorities, you know, to, to, to uh, pass one bill and, and, and you know, and, and knock one off uh, because of, uh, funding issues. We ought to know how much the fund is going to be. I, I can't imagine properly understanding, especially these uh, uh, effectively um, secret uh, conference committees at the end, uh, how they're making their decisions if we don't know the relative costs of, of the bills. Yeah. Uh, which, which takes me, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with this one, HTA lost, um, oh gosh, uh, a third of its budget, something like that. Huge. Oh, uh, but, but that one, uh, it, it's very interesting because um, it was a, a lot. A lot of the money that HTA lost was this, the the state's right hand paying the left hand anyway. Okay, because the way the way it was set up was there was this uh, large debt that was uh, set up to buy the uh, you know build the convention center, and um, so HTA owed the state a ton of money, and and the state floated bonds and. You know, and and uh, got third party financing. The convention center got built. Now the bonds are all paid off. Okay, so 
what's, what's happening is HTA was getting an appropriation of money from the state to pay off this debt that's due to the state. So the money is going in a circle. So, so somebody had the good sense to say, okay, well, why don't we then knock this off? Let's, let's cancel the debt. The anymore, yeah, yeah. So cancel the debt, uh, cancel the appropriations, and come up with a true cost of what it costs to run HTA. That sounds like good thinking to me. Yeah, I think that's good thinking. Yeah, yeah. And that's what they did. So, so sometimes it doesn't it doesn't show on the surface. Yeah. Right. So let's talk about uh, what happened. I, and I am familiar with two bills that got dashed uh, in the conference committee process uh, last week. Uh, one of them was the airport authority bill, which would have cost some money, and the other was the uh, the revamp of the energy tax credit. Um, I want to say Senate Bill 2100. It was. Famous or infamous, you know. Both of these bills have been agreed, and uh, the Senate and the House versions were almost identical in both cases, but they got they got lost at the end, and they didn't pass, and we didn't do any of those two important initiatives. Um, and uh, you know, speculation could be—I don't know how, you know, true it is—that um, the House uh, Finance Committee pulled its people out at the last minute from the. Um, the uh, what do you call it um, the conference committee, uh, thus dashing those and other bills. What well, the real reason was, that they didn't think it was enough money for those bills. You know anything about this? I, I don't know anything about it. Um, you know the, uh, the the decision on, on whether to um, go forward with or pull countries is made at the at the speaker of the house level. Uh, so you can ask him. But uh, if you know if, if it's the finance people that were being pulled, then yeah, money would probably have a lot to do with that. Yeah, that was uh, was pretty upsetting to a lot of people, the ones who were supporting those bills. I mean, and I and I feel, and I think the, uh, the airlines were supporting the airport authority idea. Felt that the airport needs needs better management, and this was provided. Uh, the hotels, I think, were supporting it. Um, so it's good for tourism, and tourism is our the engine of our economy. So, uh, and our airports get developing a reputation for being. Um, well, well below the international standard, uh, so that was really too bad because that's an investment, you know, in the future in tourism in Hawaii. Um, that's too bad. Yeah, um, and, and the airport was supposed to be redeveloped like 20 years ago. It hasn't been. Yeah, I, I think the um, for the airport authority bill, the the hang up was on the procurement law exemption uh, that you know it was reported that some legislators were uncomfortable with. Uh, you know, the, I, I suppose they were uncomfortable with setting a precedent, because then everybody else would want to come in and say, well, why can't we get exempted from the procurement yeah. law? My, my recollection is that that was changed. They were uncomfortable because there was an exemption from the procurement code, which is a, such a tender thing in Hawaii. Um, and so it was put back in. So if the bill had passed, it would have had that in it, um, you know, thus dealing with that objection. But I. I think it was um, the walkout at the last minute that caused the bill. Anyway, the other one was um, the bill for uh, uh, SB 2100, the bill for energy tax credits. And they were going to um, reduce, ramp down the uh, solar installation credits, but ramp up credits for, um, for uh, battery Batteries. storage and yeah, all battery this, storage. which was very rational, very rational. I think the industry wanted that. Um, I think everybody in the energy field wanted that. So, uh, I mean, with some exceptions, of course, but uh, that was also a bad surprise, and um, I'm not sure what happened there, but there were a lot of people very unhappy about it. Yeah, yeah one, one uh, thing that happened at the federal level that, that was uh, interesting was that on, on the federal level, they said, if you have a battery system that is installed to complement a pre-existing photovoltaic, for example, uh, then you can get the energy credit for the battery backup system. Which, uh, which I think changes the game a little bit for the Hawaii credit because the Hawaii credit, in large part, follows the federal one. Yeah. Well, here we are without either, and it's the end of a, a biennium, so they don't automatically come up next year. That's right. And so some. Well, but that that um, the energy credit bill, I've been I've I've seen that for at least three or four years. Yes, it has. Yeah. I think Airport Authority too, been around. Anyway, okay, those are, that's really too bad on that one. So you have the scary category. You have the too bad a category, and let's go into some other ones now. Uh, the withholding on uh, withholding of uh, of, uh, of proceeds on uh, um, on uh, owners uh, investors from 
uh, outside from offshore. Yeah, this on is sales this is called, real property. This is called Harpta. Uh, what that is is that if you are a non-resident who owns Hawaii real property and you sell that real property, a certain amount is withheld on the gross sales price uh, to, you know, ostensibly to to settle up your Hawaii taxes on capital gains and otherwise. So the the rate had been five percent. Uh, one bill that passed raises it to seven and a quarter, which is our maximum uh, state capital gains rate you know, for individuals. The, uh, there were some versions around that would raise it to nine percent, even beyond the max rate. Yeah, and and I think the theory behind that was uh, you you overwithhold and then you figure out oh some of these people were actually renting out their properties, so they they have other taxes to pay such as transient com or general excise, oh. and, and use that, and intercept that to pay for those liabilities, which, which we think is a kind of uh, uh, cum, cumbersome, cumbersome solution, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and not really addressing the problem that's, uh, that's at hand. But um, you know, suffice it to say, that bill passed. Uh, so the, at seven and a half percent. Seven and a quarter, yeah. Seven and a quarter, yeah. Well, there's a certain logic in it, but I tell you, uh, this is riding on a wave of, 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 of public sentiment that uh, wants to um, tax offshore investments in Hawaii. Yeah, the, you see that happening more and more. Yeah, no, and the um, uh, HSTA came up with a really, really strong rhetoric, um, just just really saying, well, yeah, we gotta we gotta pummel these guys. Yeah. You know. On, of course, the context was a little bit different. It was, it was the context of the constitutional amendment, but uh, that certainly applied in this, you know, uh, in this context as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and here's another one. Falls in the same category: the use tax on intangibles. Use tax when use tax when you import something. How does that work? Okay. So if you uh, are a consumer, for example, and you have a choice of either buying uh, you know, a widget from, from the local store or from online. Okay, if you buy from the local store, uh, it's, there's, there's gonna be a four or four and a half percent GE tax. And if nothing was done, uh, then the, the online seller would have an advantage because they're not subject to uh, Hawaii tax not being here, right? So, so the law says that if you buy from the online seller instead, you have to pay directly to the state, the 4% or the 4.5% tax. Now, um, this individual liability has existed for years. It sits in other states. Uh, compliance is very tough. They do, it enforce it, they do enforce it against businesses, okay, where they, where they have presumably more purchases, but um, it's, it's tough to go after individuals. It's hard, hard to uh, go after somebody who just ordered a pair of socks from Amazon. Right, yeah. exactly. And Amazon is not, Amazon is not, well, the law does not, at least at this point, and not require Amazon to pay a state, state gross excise. Yeah. Oh, uh, Amazon itself has started to pay, uh, effective 4 1 2017. Voluntarily. Y yeah. And so it registered for GE tax and is paying GE tax on direct sales. Okay. It's not paying on, on marketplace sales, which means they represent another seller that's located someplace else. Oh. Um, they want to be the other guy's tax collector. That's Basically, right. Basically, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they could, but they're not doing that. So um, it's you know, very complicated. Well, but it's been kicking around for a long time. Now it looks like uh, they, they did this because they saw the clouds on the horizon. They saw the ominous possibilities. Yeah. Now, uh, that is, is, is tax on tangible personal property. Okay. That's what? Tax on tangible personal property. Yeah. So our state has that. Other states have that. Okay. We also impose use tax on services and contracting, which other states don't do. Give me an example. Like, for example, um, if I were to uh, engage a mainland consultant to do something for to help my business here, uh, and I pay him like $1,000, I'm supposed to pay the state 40 bucks. Because the, the mainland consultant's help, helping me. Uh, I've imported the service for my business. I'm here. Uh, so that's, again, I have a choice of either buying local from, from somebody who's subject to the tax, or buying one buying from the mainland who's who's not, okay, and so so the, so the, the next logical step according to the uh, the bill supporters is okay. Let's apply this to intangible property also. So so if um, uh, if I'm let's say running a McDonald's franchise, 
Okay. And um, I pay somebody on the mainland uh, a franchise fee. You know, shouldn't somebody paying, be paying 4% on the franchise fee? Okay. Uh, and supposedly, under the logic of the bill, uh, if the mainland seller doesn't pay it, I got to pay it. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the people who were supporting this bill really thought through how it works, because there is some law that says, in that situation, the franchisor is liable for our general excise tax, and so they ought to be paying it anyway. Right. And, so, and so the use tax. This is an enforcement question first of an existing law, right? That's right. So did this uh, use tax on intangibles pass? It passed. Oh, so now it's kind of a duplication on the same point, yeah? Well, it's going to lead to, at, at a minimum, confusion as to who's got to pay it. Uh, you know, with even with tax on tangible personal property, there was, like, uh, decades of confusion in the auto industry, right? Because the um, manufacturers weren't paying weren't paying use tax or, or general excise tax. Uh, the dealerships were paying the use tax because they thought they had to. And then, and then they caught a few um, manufacturers with local presence, you know, like maybe they had a sales staff or, or salesperson or something, and they, and they hit them for general excise tax. Uh, did they give the use tax back to the, the local guys? No. <laughs> At the same time, do I have this right? They did not actually impose a tax on goods, on tangibles, like what Amazon sells through mail order in Hawaii, right? I mean, Amazon pays it voluntarily, but there's no law imposing the gross excise, specifically imposing the gross excise on internet sales into Hawaii, right? Well, it, th there is a law that, that imposes it. The question is whether Hawaii has enough jurisdiction over the uh, or enough enough connection with the seller to to enable it to um, have power to impose the tax. So it's a practical. So question. it's a you know it's a U.S. constitutional question. Wow. So in many cases, Hawaii is not imposing that tax because they can't. Yeah, because they can't. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, this is a very interesting this year. I, uh, I, I don't have the sense that um, what Scott Psyche about, said was about being a progressive. Uh, session is actually really true. There were a lot of distractions and diversions. And what I thought coming in, and, and that's my last question to you, Tom, what I thought coming in is that we, things look good. We had a good year in tourism. Uh, the Council on Revenues predicted, you know, mucho revenues. Uh, and yet we were nickel and diming. Uh, what happened to all the money? Why, why are we trying to increase taxes when we already have a, a, pretty, a pretty robust tax base? Well, the financial plan that was submitted by the governor's office um, was out of balance. It was $200 million short. And then uh, the actuary for the EUTF, you know, the Employer Union Trust Fund that gives the state retiree health plan, uh, said that we needed to come up with $50 million more. Okay? So, so already we're $250 million in, in, the, in the hole. And this made them nervous. Of course it did. I mean, they have to pass a balanced budget. Yeah, they have to pass a balanced budget. And that's always the concern for the legislature every year. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you, Tom. Thanks for coming down. We'll do this again, I hope, soon. Tom Yamachika, hey, president of, of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii.